you had sent a tweet out a little bit ago about asking about uh, if you if there's any interest to talk about the hierarchy of papal documents, and I think that kind of mm. plays into our conversation here. Yeah, um, like I, I'll be honest, I've been doing this for a year now, and I don't know. Like, I have a rough idea of the hierarchy of papal documents. Like, what what can you give us a quick rundown? Like, what's the highest? What's the lowest? And even the lowest, like, how much authority should we take this with? You know, an apostolic constitution is is definitely one of the highest when it comes to papal documents. There, There's different kinds of magisterial documents, papal or conciliar. If we're speaking about uh, papal, apostolic constitutions, pretty, pretty high, if not the highest. Um, just kind of depends on what what he's doing. Uh, but usually whenever he's speaking on faith and morals, it's an apostolic constitution. Lowest would probably be something like a papal homily, uh, arguably, right? Some some might push back on that and say, okay, well, I don't think that's magisterial. With the proper qualifications, I, I would definitely place it within his magisterium. Um, and maybe we could argue for maybe some lower levels below a papal homily, but that's that's extremely debated. So there's a range between, say, an apostolic constitution and perhaps a papal homily. There's a range of authority or degrees or weightiness uh, by which he may teach. And, and by the way, an apostolic constitution, a lot of people have heard of those as papal bulls. They're not necessarily identical, but people have probably heard more about a papal bull than they yeah, have yeah. an apostolic constitution. A bull was just the uh, seal, usually a lead seal, although there were different kinds of seals that could be used. Um, it was just a seal that was used at the end of the document. And they are often used for apostolic constitutions. Um, <clears throat> and then there are also conciliar documents. A constitution of the church issued by an ecumenical council would probably be the highest, although you could argue a profession of faith issued by an ecumenical council might even be uh, slightly higher than a constitution issued by an ecumenical council. And then they can go, you know, lower in, in degrees of authority. Um, <clears throat> you have decrees and things like that, for example, that you could see at um, at uh, Vatican II. So there, there's a range of conciliar documents that have been issued historically. And again, they they vary in their weightiness. And what's what's curious, though, is you could issue a definitive teaching within any kind of document. You, mm -hmm. Usually, though, if the Pope does it, it's within an apostolic constitution. But frankly, the Pope could issue a definitive teaching, something ex cathedra, in a papal homily if he wanted. I mean, no Pope has ever done so. And he would need to make it explicitly clear that he's doing so for us to know it since it's so irregular. But frankly, any any way in which he teaches in his magisterium, he could issue something definitive. So um, there's a lot of ways in which we could come at this. We could speak of definitive teachings, non-definitive teachings. And then when it comes to those non-definitive teachings, we can speak of a hierarchy of weight when it comes to the document in which they're in. And then those aren't the only measures that dictate how authoritative and weighty a teaching is. The document, document in which it's issued factors in, but there are other factors as well. Yeah. So, OK, on that note, uh, you had Jimmy Aiken on your show uh, and he said there, there are something like, depending on how you count them, four to 15 ex cathedra document statements. And he leaned more on the side of like that there were possibly eight. I've only heard of two, the um, Immaculate Conception and Assumption of Mary. How many do you think there are? If you had to yeah, the <clears throat> the 15 number, I, I could see somebody uh, saying that. I mean, of course, you have things like the Tome of Leo or uh, Agatha at the Sixth Council or uh, Augustinus. Um, well, when, whenever uh, Augustinus was uh, definitively interpreted by the Pope, I forget which Pope it was offhand, um, Unum Sanctum, there, there's a few other documents we could issue or that we could mention beyond just those two that some mm -hmm. some would know. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, I'm, I'm fine with somebody saying 15, although I might push back and challenge that a little bit more because Gasser, again, in his Relatio of Vatican I, thinks that there are thousands upon thousands of definitive papal teachings. And you ask, okay, well, how can that be? Well, there's what's called um, global censors. 
Uh, it's not something we hear often about, um, especially, you know, after the Second Vatican Council. You definitely don't see these a whole lot. But prior to the Second Vatican Council, they used censors uh, to condemn certain propositions. And then you would have what's called a global censor where you condemn a whole bunch of propositions in one uh, in one, uh, one fell swoop, if you will. Instead of condemning them individually, you just condemn the whole thing. It's called the global censor. Well, <clears throat> if you count all of those global censors and every one of the individual propositions that could be condemned, perhaps definitively, we could, we could, we could start to add up a whole bunch of ex cathedra teachings of a so it's not like case that goes way beyond 15. So yeah. it kind of depends on how are we defining these things. I What I like more than just, okay, well, how many ex cathedra teachings are there? What I like just discussing and, and the way I like to phrase it is, did the Pope propose this definitively? I, I like using that language a little bit better. And I think that there's a whole bunch of things that the Pope has put forward definitively uh, beyond just 15 maybe solemn uh, ex cathedra dec declarations. Okay, so something you just said there, uh, this is like my biggest irksome moment with Catholicism. And frankly, the the best argument against Catholicism that I've, that I've thought of. Uh -huh. We have this idea of sacred tradition. We have this idea of like just de definitive teaching outside of sacred scripture. Okay, cool. But we don't know what that is. Like we haven't, we haven't ever said, yeah, like to, to make a dogmatic teaching that everyone has to accept and believe, this is what you say. Instead, we have these arguments about like, well, are there four ex cathedra statements? Are there 15? Was anything definitively teached at, or taught, excuse me, at a uh, second Vatican council? Like, yeah. the, actually, I was really happy that in Lumen Gentium, in the, uh, in the appendix, it says, like, these are the things that are explicitly, definitively taught. And then you'd control F that phrase and you only get one thing, you know, like, like, wh why is this, why is this a problem in Catholicism that we don't know what we teach definitively? It's a really good question, although I, I would say it's not as bad as it sounds. Um, I think it is a little bit more clear cut than that. But before I maybe go into that. Let me just note, let's just pretend for the moment that it is somewhat ambiguous. The point, however, is we can always go to the current living magisterium and ask for clarification, and it could issue a definitive answer, and, okay. one, it, and one that is so abundantly clear okay. that we can okay. know whether this is definitive or not. Yeah. So <clears throat> somebody, you know, I, I asks the Holy See, okay, wait, uh, is Ordinatio Sacerdotalis definitive, right? I mean, we can get, and in fact have received, um, a clear cut answer from the magisterium. And, and if somebody pushes back and says, well, what if that's ambiguous? Okay, we can go back to the living magisterium and ask for further clarification okay. until the point that it's so painfully clear that we know this proposition is definitive. Mm -hmm. Now, so there's definitely something objectively superior to the Catholic claim that's able to provide that. As opposed to maybe sola scriptura, where I can't ask my Bible, hey, is this what you mean? I mean, I, I know what you're proposing is definitive, but is this what you mean when, when you say that? I can't ask my Bible that, but I can't ask yeah. the living magisterium. So there is something objectively better uh, when it comes to the Catholic teaching authority than uh, non-Catholics. But the question still remains, is it really so unclear that uh, we can really have these debates on what's definitive. You know, part of it is, you know, Vatican I gives us certain parameters to determine what is ex cathedra. It does give us some general parameters, but it deliberately chose not to give a set formula. The reason why is there has never been a set formula used historically for papal definitive teachings. So you can't give a set formula, at least not one that applies for the last 2000 years. Maybe we could say, okay, from now on, if you're going to teach definitively, use this set formula. Maybe we could do that from here on out. But you look at Leo's tome, he's not using a set formula, but is it clear that he thought that he was teaching something definitive? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, would that not be 
ex cathedra, at least according to the definition that's offered by Vatican I? I would argue so. So I think in many cases it is clear cut. But there might be some occasional, you know, questions here and there. Is this a definitive proposition or not? And in those more rare cases, if there's any ambiguity, we can always go to the living magisterium and ask. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. That's